All right, welcome to week two of the Sermon on the Mount course. This is the video. Hopefully it will serve two purposes. Uh, it will be a brief introduction to the assignment for week two, and then we'll try to spend a little bit of time on the Beatitudes, as much time as we have uh, that is allowed on these on these brief uh, brief uh, videos. <clears throat> so we want to uh, start off by uh, talking about your assignment for uh, this week. It's a short assignment uh, and it is, uh, so it, you know, it should not take a long time. And also it is due on Saturday night this week. So you don't have a Tuesday assignment this week. Gives you a little more time, kind of start off slowly, which is what we're trying to do. So what the assignment will involve will be translating Matthew 5, 1 through 12. It will be translation only. Now remember on the parsing, what we've decided is that you will do, uh, you will do, you need to know your parsing, but you don't have to write it down and turn it in. You can use whatever tools you have, uh, but use them as a learning experience. Just think about what you're doing. Think about what the words are, both verbs and nouns so that uh, you, you will uh, be able then to translate it in an accurate way. So do that. Uh, then you will need to, uh, once you've made your translation, you'll need to post that in assignments. The uh, instructions for doing that are given in detail in your uh, PowerPoint for this week. It is very important that you follow that, uh, that uh, power. PowerPoint. You also need to do a review of a phrasing. Uh, so uh, I've asked you to take a look at that and uh, uh, do the uh, uh, just just kind of review that. And make sure that you that you look over it uh, again uh, during during this week. Make sure you understand that too, so you can use that. I posted my phrasing for uh, Matthew. Uh, I will post my phrasing for Matthew 5, 1 through 12 uh, on the uh, PowerPoint for week two. It'll be in week two folder, so you need to uh, take a look at that, if you will. Uh, check it out and see how I do it. You don't have to do it that way. Remember, you need to do your own phrasing. You just want this to be a learning process so that you can use it in uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the exegesis of, of your passages. Now, if you have any questions, whatever the questions are, uh, please uh, uh, don't hesitate to uh, uh, send an email to me or go to discussion board and post things on the discussion board. Next week, week three, we will begin uh, the group work. So group alpha, you need to be working together, getting to know each other, making sure that you are uh, that you're doing, yeah, that you're uh, understanding what your assignments are. Uh, go ahead and get a, get a head start on that, if you will. Uh, if you need resources for that, please give me a call. You certainly are welcome to use uh, the WebEx. I really encourage you to use the WebEx at least for an initial meeting and possibly for uh, a, you know, a concluding meeting. Whatever else you use during that time is your decision. But uh, I just encourage you to take advantage of whatever is there. All right, now we have uh, several minutes left, so I want to try to just give you a little bit of a, an overview of the uh, uh, of the Beatitudes. I uh, this is uh, really an important passage of Scripture, as I've indicated to you. Uh, uh, it is uh, Jesus setting his agenda as he looks forward to the work that he has for the disciples to do. He's training them, and this is certainly a part of their training. It's very likely that the, uh, uh, I'm saying, in fact, it seems very clear from the text that there was a large crowd around hanging out with Jesus, as they often did. They were listening to what he had to say. But the main thrust of his training period here was for his disciples, those whom he had called or would call, as he brought them together to give them, uh, to give them that training. So, we're going to look at uh, uh, at the Beat at the Beatitudes, uh, starting with a little bit of an intro. Uh, this is still early in the ministry of Jesus. 
Uh, we don't know how many disciples he's called at this point. It may be that he's called all of them, but uh, whatever the situation is, um, he has brought them together to this hillside uh, north of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, is, uh, he is giving them then some, some training. So what's he talking about? Uh, he, is, uh, he is talking about the kingdom. Now, let's not get hung up on the kingdom. This is what I would encourage you. Don't get hung up on the kingdom. There are a lot of people who have a lot of different opinions about the kingdom of God. But let's look for a, uh, a definition, a working definition of the kingdom that we can all work with and uh, that won't cause us to get hung up. I would suggest to you that the kingdom of God is something like this. It is the rule or the reign of God in the hearts of his people. Now that's general. That doesn't just simply have an eschatological meaning. It doesn't simply have an Old Testament meaning. It doesn't simply have a New Testament meaning because I think the kingdom is a broader term than any of this. It applies certainly to all of God's dealing with his people uh, throughout uh, the ages. So what is God doing in his kingdom? He is seeking to build kingdom character in those who follow him. And that's going to be an important concept as you, as you study this Sermon on the Mount. Just remember that uh, it, it is a, uh, he's talking about characteristics of kingdom citizens. And that means specifically what the character is supposed to be for those who follow him in his kingdom, those who, uh, those who lead others to follow him as well. Character is on the inside, and character has to do with righteousness. Now, the New Testament makes it very clear that the only true righteousness, as Dr. Ed Glaze used to say, the only true righteousness is the righteousness of God as it is worked by God in us, manifested in us, as he changes us, as he transforms us and makes us into a new creation. That's what he's doing as he builds character in us. And that's what he's talking about here. And we need to remember also that character comes, uh, I mean, produces a changed attitude in us, a changed mindset. If you go back often and read Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and you can get the mind of Paul as he talks about the mindset of Christ in us. And that's, that's what he's talking about. That's what Jesus is working on here. He is, uh, he is saying, I want you to, uh, to uh, have the same mindset that Jesus has. And that, of course, is what Jesus is trying to do here. As he, ta- as he seeks to transform us and give us a new attitude, give us a new mindset, because action comes out of attitude, not the other way around. When our mindset is changed, then our actions are going to be changed. And that's what Jesus is trying to produce in us, so that the result will be obedience. It'll be doing what he tells us to do. So uh, he's working out his purpose. How do you fit into that purpose? That's the big question as you think about the agenda of Jesus. So in very many ways, the kingdom is synonymous with his will, with his purpose, with his working out his purpose in us. Kingdom citizens are those who are being transformed by Jesus as he works out his purpose in us, as he makes us what he wants us to be. So it's a new lifestyle. It's everyday discipleship. And that's what he's trying to get uh, uh, worked in us. He's trying to transform our hearts so that our hearts will be like his. So how can you get there? Well, the only way you can get there is when you're changed from, when he changes you from the inside. You have that desire to be ruled by him and then there is that transformation that takes place and then we begin to do what he wants us to do when we've been transformed. Notice that these are the Beatitudes. Now, I know I'm pushing the point here. I realize that because the word means uh, blessed or happy, something like that. But I do think it's important for us to emphasize that being is more important than doing because the doing is not going to take place until the being occurs 
in us until we're transformed, our mindset, our attitude is transformed, and then we can begin to act like he wants us to act. So he says uh, that uh, there's, this is what we ought to be doing. I want to tell you about a book. Uh, it's an old book, and I don't know even, you probably have to find it. It's a used book because I'm sure it's out of print. I found one recently. Someone had borrowed mine, and I found another one on Amazon. It is written by Gerald Mann, M-A-N-N, and the name of the book is Why Does Jesus Make Me Nervous? I think Mann does an excellent job in helping us to understand something about this agenda that Jesus is setting. He doesn't use that terminology, but that's what he's talking about. And what he, what he is saying to us is that that goal is happiness. And what real happiness is, is that joy that comes, the kind of happiness that he wants us to have, is that joy that's there on the inside. Now, man reminds us that we're not guaranteed happiness. Uh, you know, we say, well, yeah, but that's what the, that's what the uh, um, Declaration of Independence talks about. Is, you know, we have that right to happiness. No, that's not what it says. If you read it closely, you say we have the right to the pursuit of happiness. And of course, for us as followers of Christ, the only way we can pursue happiness is to pursue Him. Because it's only when we come to know His will and we come to live in that will that we're going to have that kind of happiness. So, uh, I want us to look, I want to look very briefly, and we're probably going to have to do this in, in a follow-up video, because I'm going to go probably about 15 minutes on this one, and then I'll give you another one. So I need you to watch both of them, if you will, because I can only do 15 minutes in these videos. All right, so what I want us to do is to understand uh, as much as we can, at least briefly, uh, what these Beatitudes are about. Uh, the word means happy, but uh, it means more than that. Uh, we can't achieve happiness. We don't have a right to happiness. That's what I want to point out to you. Uh, but we and we don't find happiness when we're looking for it. If you're looking for happiness, your goal is on the looking part, and so you don't find the happiness. That's what man points out to us. It only comes happiness only comes when we seek the will of God, when we seek to be uh, a part of His kingdom, kingdom citizen, and we seek to be working in His kingdom. So when our hearts are changed and we begin to live as kingdom citizens then we are in we come to be in a blessed state or in a happy state that uh, that joy that comes from knowing and doing the will of god so he starts out by talking to us about the poor in spirit uh, several things I, I would just point out to you here just in a bullet point style and then you can come back and listen to it uh, and think about this uh, and then come to your own conclusions let me remind you of a few things. First of all, riches do not bring happiness. It's not exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Is it? He's not saying if you have some riches, you'll be, you'll be happy. But it is also true that poverty does not bring happiness. And I think that's the point that we need to understand. Luke talks about this from a, from a, a perspective of physical riches or poverty. And, and what he's saying that, that uh, those who are poor... Are, uh, can be happy, that they can have this joy uh, that's spoken of here. What Matthew is talking about, and I think what is the main emphasis uh, of uh, his account, is that it is poverty of spirit. So it is a spiritual poverty, uh, not material riches, that he is speaking of here. So what does that mean? It means that we recognize that uh, we are spiritually in poverty. We don't have any righteousness of our own. We don't have any ability to create that righteousness in us. Only he can do that. So it's those who depend on him, who recognize that they cannot bring in the kingdom on their own, but we join with him and work with him in the accomplishment of that purpose. Like Henry Blackaby taught us all so well uh, that, uh, that this, is, uh, this is what's really important is for us to find out where God is working and get involved in, in, in that work with him and do that work with him as we seek to do his will 